Following the surrender of Japan and the end of the Second World War, a parade of victors was held in Berlin to mark the occasion. It would be an opportunity for the Allied powers to show off some of their newest tank designs. The United States and Great Britain displayed their newest light and medium tanks, the Chaffee and Comet respectively. The Soviet Union, however, chose to display their newest heavy tank, the IS-3. There was no mistaking which of the three tanks left the biggest impression. And as the Iron Curtain descended over Europe, both of the Western powers scrambled for an answer to this breakthrough tank. Eventually, the United Kingdom would produce the Conqueror heavy tank. Before that, however, was Conway. Hello, dear viewer. Tanks Encyclopedia is currently closing in on 100,000 subscribers. With this important milestone in sight, we'd like to remind you to subscribe if you enjoy our content and want to see more. Now, back to the video. A mere five years after the end of the Second World War, relations between the West and East were becoming increasingly strained, not helped by the newly broken out war on the Korean Peninsula. Top British generals grew concerned that, should war erupt between the West and East in Europe, the British Army would have nothing capable of taking on the IS-3, then believed to be in service in large numbers. In the autumn of 1950, an upgun program was started with the goal of re-equipping existing tank designs with heavier firepower. This program would look at equipping tanks like the Cromwell and even the Churchill with 84, 120, and even 180 mm guns. Perhaps the most well-known design to emerge from this program was the Charioteer, a Cromwell equipped with a new turret armed with a 20-pounder 84mm gun. The next stage of the program was to look at introducing newer weapon systems onto existing platforms, while purpose-built designs were still under development. These systems included the Ordnance quick-firing 120mm L1 tank cannon. Although initially dismissed as being too much work to adapt, the Centurion was eventually accepted as the base model for such a vehicle. In these early stages, the vehicle was simply referred to as the 120mm Centurion, or the FV-4004. It would later be named Conway, after the town and castle of the same name in North Wales. The program worked within strict margins, needing to produce such a vehicle at speed without interfering with production and development of both the Centurion and Conqueror tanks. The hull, thus, was to be that of the Mark III Centurion. The turret would be replaced with a new, purpose-built one capable of containing the much larger 120mm gun. Initial considerations of a relatively low-profile turret, not dissimilar to the conventional Centurion, were discarded due to the weight of the new gun and the imbalanced center of gravity. This could have placed more wear on the forward suspension units and drastically shortened the service life. A low-profile turret would have also been imbalanced, which would have prevented the full rotation of the turret with the Centurion's traverse mechanisms. To correct this issue would have meant expanding the turret ring impossible to do due to the need to not interfere with the production of the Centurion. The solution, thus, was to place the gun higher, which in turn meant a larger turret. This had the benefit of resolving the previous issues while also allowing the gun to recoil back into the turret bustle. This meant that, after firing, the gun could eject the spent shell casing through a door at the back of the turret. On the other hand, it meant the vehicle would have a much larger profile and hence would be a bigger target. Vertical traverse was also limited to a mere 10 degrees up or 5 degrees down. Design and production of the turret was assigned to Ulster Aircraft Limited. The turret would be of welded construction, unlike the Centurion's which was casted, another decision made to reduce the impact on Centurion production. The turret would undergo a number of changes from its original mock-up design to the real thing. Most notably, the gun mantlet became more rectangular and a piece of inset triangular plates were added at the forward bottom left and right corners, a feature meant to prevent the turret, when turned, obstructing the driver's hatch and preventing their escape in the event the vehicle was hit. To the rear of the turret was a large door, meant to allow shell casings to be discarded out of the turret after firing. This process could be done manually, with the loader manhandling the casings through the door. But if the door was open during firing, the recoil would have sent the shell casing out of the turret without the crew's assistance. On the prototype models, the door was manually operated, but on a production model, it likely would have been automated. Also of interest at the turret rear was a mounting point for a telephone wire. In defensive positions, this wire would have run from one tank to another and allowed them to communicate with each other without the use of radios. The turret would carry the impressive ordnance quick-firing 120mm tank L1 cannon, 
weighing 3 imperial tons and nearly 7.5 meters in length. The L-1 was one of the largest tank guns when entering British service. Conceived as a giant killer for use against Soviet heavy tanks like the IS-3, the L-1 could fire an armor-piercing discarding Sabo or high-explosive squash head round with acceptable accuracy up to a range of 1,800 meters. Its armor-piercing round could penetrate a 120mm armor plate even when angled at 55 degrees. Against an unangled plate, this performance could rise to nearly 390 millimeters of penetration. Similarly, the Hesh round, though technically meant for use against targets such as buildings or similar enemy defensive positions, could create spalling effects on the opposite side of an armor plate 120mm thick angled at 60 degrees. Such potent anti-armor capabilities would provide British armored regiments with an effective anti-tank weapon capable of defeating Soviet heavy tanks, which it was feared would see off a regiment lacking such firepower. The L-1 was certainly no silver bullet, however. Its impressive capabilities came with a price, namely that the shells were incredibly heavy and the Conway would not be able to carry many of them into battle. Although the shells were two-stage, meaning a loader could handle the propellant and then the round itself individually, they had to maneuver shells weighing a total of around 35 or 37 kilograms, Hesh and APDS respectively, around a cramped turret interior. The Conway's rate of fire was thus likely to not have been great, although this may have been preferable as the tank could only carry 20 rounds, with 11 of these in the turret ready rack and another 9 next to the driver in the hull. A Conway crew would have thus needed to make every shot count had they seen action. For use against infantry and other soft targets, the Conway mounted a coaxial L3A1, the British designation for the American M19A4 30 caliber Browning machine gun. A total of 3,750 rounds were carried for the machine gun. For concealment, the Conway also carried two sets of smoke launchers carrying a total of 12 smoke grenades. Armor protection was roughly equivalent to the Centurion. The hull was unchanged from the standard model and boasted 76 mm of angled armor at the front with 50 and 38 mm of protection for the sides and rear respectively. The turret was somewhat more protected with between 132 and 95 mm of armor at the turret face and 48 and 30 mm of armor at the sides and rear. While such protection would be enough against small arms and artillery splinters, it would do less well against tank guns. Armor tests against British 6 and 17 pounders demonstrated that rounds to the turret mantlet would be resisted, but that impacts on the turret face itself would result in internal spalling. Interestingly, for the armor tests, there were no L1 guns available, and instead a substitute gun was placed in the turret, the infamous German 88, the KWK 36L-56 from off a Tiger. The L1 would be test fired from Conway, which proved at least that the whole design would work. But, much like the World War II-era Sherman Firefly, the muzzle blast created a large amount of obscuration from the smoke and debris of firing, hindering the ability of the commander or gunner from observing where the round eventually landed, and their ability to correct their aim as needed. Despite the development of the Conway reaching the point of firing trials and an expected entry into service in April 1953, it appears as though no decision was made to begin production, and by 1955, the Conqueror was entering service, rendering Conway surplus to requirement. A pair of vehicles were produced for the project, and one of these still survives at the Bovington Tank Museum. It is currently in the museum's conservation center after having spent many years as an outdoor display. Had Conway entered service, it would likely have been distributed to the British Army of the Rhine in West Germany in a similar manner as the Conqueror was, with each armored regiment receiving a company of nine tanks. In a Cold War-turned-hot scenario, the Conway would have found itself employed primarily in overwatch tasks, providing covering fire and engaging targets at longer ranges than the more common Centurion could engage at. Conway, always intended as a stopgap measure, would have likely seen a very short period of service, as even the Conqueror was retired after only 11 years of service. And that's it for this video. What do you think? Was Conway an ingenious solution or a doomed project that never should have left the drawing board? Share your opinions in the comments section below. If you haven't done so already, we invite you to subscribe to stay updated on future content. If you'd like to contribute further, consider supporting us on Patreon or PayPal. We want to especially thank our medium and heavy tank Patreon supporters. Dan Fitzpatrick, Dave Shuford, Leslie Hulkauer, 
Michael Herman, Nick H, Owen M, R Rob, Sopwith21, and Wolfhund. Your generous contributions help fund our research, illustrations, and video production. Until next time, keep us in your sights.